joining us for the Free Mind Podcast. Uh, we are very proud to have uh, Steve Groff here of Cedo Meadow Farms, Cover, cover Crop co Coaching, and stevegroff.com. Steve is a well-versed, uh, long lineage in the farming and regenerative agriculture world. Uh, thanks, Steve, for joining us today. How are you doing today? Doing great, Nate. Uh, pleasure to talk to you. Excellent, excellent. Thanks so much for joining us. We really do appreciate you taking the time, and we want to learn a little, a lot more about Steve Groff and about regenerative farming and uh, this uh, new certifications that are coming and some new ways that we can teach consumers about what it is that they're putting in their body. So uh, I want to kind of jump right into kind of the story of Steve. So tell us, 18-year-old uh, Steve Groff, kind of looking at the world. Is this is this where you saw? Uh, is this where you saw yourself going? Well, let's start a little before 18. I'm All a right. third generation farmer. My grandparents bought the place I live on here uh, in 1935. My uh, dad bought the neighboring farm in 1967. That's where I grew up. They've been farmed together, but there's farms ever since. When I was 18 years old, graduated from high school, I had um, I never had a desire to go to college, so I never did. But I, when people ask me, like after they hear me speak, they'll say, well, what? where did you graduate from? I'm like, well, I never did graduate from college because I'm still in it. I'm still learning. Uh, so when I was 18, basically, I was ready to farm. And uh, my dad basically gave me, I guess you would say, some of the responsibilities at that time. And um, that's actually when I traced back my regenerative roots. And we can talk about that. But so I did graduate from high school and went right to the farm. Excellent. So when you uh, when you were on the farm there, were you taking these same tactics that you're now having the certification for? Was that always part of your, your structure and now it's just kind of more of a public certification type? No. Uh, just to give a little context more here, I graduated in 1982, so you can figure out my age, graduated from high school, that is. Uh, so it's been 41 years, uh, this journey. And it all started because I had ditches in my sloping fields from when it rained, you know, heavily that the, the water washed ditches down through my fields. And I couldn't cross those ditches with my tractor, my equipment to harvest my crops. I had to close them first. And at the time, I thought that's just, you know, an extra thing. It's just not, you know, it's just an extra thing to do. I didn't have any really clue about soil health. I could really say I could care less about water quality at that point. I didn't know there was a problem. Uh, but what I realized, and I started a practice called no-till, which is short for no tillage. I started that in 1982, that today that has led me on a journey to literally grow food as medicine. And there's a lot we can unpack there. And I, I wrote a book about that. Maybe we can talk about that later. But uh, so that's how it all got started back in 1982. All because I had a problem on my farm of ditches. Uh, and because I solved that, that led on this uh, this long journey that continues today. Excellent. Well, yeah, great intro uh, and, and transition into uh, into the book there. Without giving anything away as far as the spoilers of the book, kind of what are what are what can people look forward to in your book? Where can they access it and uh, and so forth? The book is called The Future Proof Farm. Subtitle: Changing Mindsets in a Changing World. It's not a how to farm book. It doesn't give you the specifics of that. It's rather more of our mindset, the way we think about our approach of growing food. The book is written for farmers, but also for consumers. And thirdly, for those who are in the supply chain. So kind of everybody involved in agriculture, I want to give them a perspective that this is where agriculture is headed. The regenerative movement, the regenerative agriculture movement which really focuses on regenerating the soil, making it better, not just sustaining it, but regenerating it, making it better. So I talk a lot about my, my experiences of travel. I've spoken in 12 different countries all over the U.S. and Canada, and just sharing how farmers have made this transition into regenerative agriculture. Now, I do explain what more what that means in the book, but you can get the book at stevegroff.com, stevegroff.com. And, um, you know, if you're interested, again, it, consumers, farmers, supply chain, all those people will find it interesting. It's an easy read. Uh, I've got a lot of compliments on that, that it's a it's a nice, smooth read. So uh, so check it out. Perfect. Excellent. It's good for the coffee table and more. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Well, yeah. So making it better in regenerative farming, 
You know, uh, the other day we talked with, uh, we actually uh, had a podcast with a, a CEO of Sage Bistro, which is a, uh, a chain of uh, vegan uh, bistro restaurants out in Los Angeles. And she uh, strategically purchases uh, from regenerative farmers in California uh, for her uh, supplies and things like that. So it was an interesting story there from the retailer side of things. And now actually she still has all those chains and she's down in Texas opening. Um, she has a farm, uh, 300 acres down there she's doing called Sovereignty Farm. And they're actually going to be converting it over. Uh, they're growing hops there now uh, regeneratively and then selling them to themselves as well as their own brewery in California and then opening another brewery down in Texas. So uh, definitely enjoying seeing this this movement. Uh, as far as the criteria goes, and I know you've been you've been preaching for a long time, but I I think that the, you know one of the things is a lot of people have to have that groundwork laid for them before they can jump in, and I think that's a compliment to you and many others in your space that are p- kind of paving the way for showing people you don't have to create it from scratch. Here's how you do it, and and kind of you know rather than the stories being heard from from laying it out there and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. is that something you feel like pretty 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 yeah. Similar? Yeah, it's a simple concept, but very complex to yeah. be able to do effectively. Because we as farmers, I'm going to speak as a farmer now, we have done things, some is by tradition and some things by, it's like tried and true and proven over the decades. You know, my grandpa did it, did it this way. My dad did it this way. We, we That's a common theme in agricultural settings. But there are, obviously, as we know, there's, as in many things in life, there are some ways now that are better, and I like to kind of couple it together. Be, it's better for the people and the planet because if we want to grow healthy food, we're going to have to have a healthy planet. And the linkage between those two, you know, you could say, well, that you know, that's very, very far apart. No, it's actually not. It's very closely related. Now, we want to mimic nature as much as possible. And, you know, people can hear this and say, well, yeah, that's a good idea, Steve. Well, I'm going to challenge you. If you really want to do that, then you need to go out and forage for berries and nuts. Well, I'm not really interested in that. But how can we as farmers grow food in a way that does mimic the principles of nature in order to supply myself, my friends, and everyone else with food to eat? So that's really what the premise of this whole regenerative agriculture movement is is what lessons can we learn from nature and apply them now with what we know? You know, there has been, someone has said, we know more about the Milky Way and beyond than we do the six inches of soil underneath our feet. And that's kind of sobering, but when you start learning what goes on in the soil at a microbial level, at a level that we can only see some things that, you know, thousands of times magnified in our microscope. We start to understand that. Then we can better understand how the soil is designed to function, and then we can learn how to manage it. See, there hasn't been a lot of research on six inches below our feet uh, because we have all these inputs that we can buy, and it makes it easy, you know, and and it's there's a such a parallel, and we might want to get into this, Nate, mm-hmm. between – Big ag and big pharma. Uh, And I probably just right now just open up a big can of worms. Uh, But, you know, what happens? What's the first thing you do when you have a headache? Oh, well, you reach for a pill. Uh, Or, you know, so often people are are going after the easy fix. I'm not against pills. But we've relied on that too much when we should be thinking about what is the food that I'm eating that I could maybe avoid chronic diseases that are so prevalent today. You know that Americans spend, on average, as much on health care as they do on food. And that's when you add everything in, all the prescriptions and everything. It's about $5,000 a year. Um, so, you know, something's wrong with that picture, in my mind. So this is where we have to grow food in a way that is more nutritious, more nutrient-dense. So we can talk about the environment all day. And that's the fun thing that people like to talk about. But I will tell you, if we grow food that is nutrient dense, the environment aspect will take care of itself. Because in order to protect the soil from degrading or eroding, like I had to do, you know, 41 years ago when I started it, if we grow it to protect that. Oh, by the way, the bonus is we have healthier food, not only healthier food, but in my case, I grow CBD, CBD hemp, 
And, uh, you know, we're working with uh, locally here with uh, Penn State College of Medicine and evaluating the um, just the efficacy of the CBD grown on regenerative soils. And we are seeing a difference. Now, it's too early to, you know, make claims and everything. There's clinical trials are forthcoming, but we're seeing a difference. Oh, that's a clue. How can I manage to actually make even medicine? So the whole uh, moniker of food as medicine, there's something behind that. And that's what I'm trying to do. No, that's it. That's phenomenal. And do you do you when you look at this uh, with this type of thing? Do you, are you all you're you're very ingrained in in into the actual growth and the overall societal piece? You're not just one guy that's a cog in the machine. I mean, you're you're on the forefront of leading and speaking. You're a very public figure in this aspect. Yeah, I um, and it's just not something I actually aspire to do. I didn't plan that I'm going to do everything I'm doing. It just happened. I do enjoy helping people. And I think as I evaluate what you know gets me up in the morning, so to speak, helping people and then helping the planet. I mean, I, I just like those two words. They do go hand in hand. And so, you know, I've been collaborating with, partnering with, you know, some of the leaders in these various aspects of field and food is nutrition, food is medicine. Uh, and, and so, you know, I don't know it all. I'm still learning. I got a lot to learn. And by the way, I've made a lot of mistakes along the journey, uh, but just try not to make them too big uh, is my goal. Uh, anyway, so to, to me, it's important to network with people who are smarter than me in the various aspects of this whole topic we're talking about. So I am very open to collaborating with others. I mean, literally here at my farm in the next half hour, I have some people coming here to talk about a partnership collaborative effort here in the state of Pennsylvania that can be very significant in the whole aspect of growing hemp. So these are the things that I enjoy doing and that I really have uh, found to be helpful for me as a person, for me as a business. And then again, the result is helping other people live a healthier life. When you, when you speak to your, your family about kind of the evolution of, of the farm and the, let's call it the family business as it is, you know, a lot of, of farmers, you know, you, you, you farmer, you grow up in a, in a farm, you, you've always been part of it. It's been ingrained in your life. Mm. You took it to kind of another level. You know what I mean? It wasn't just growing the farm, servicing whole foods, you know, things like that with the, with the products and produce and things like that. You've gone to an advancement of saying, okay, here's new things that are going on. Here's new ways I can also use my farm. Granted, regenerative regenerative agriculture, the way you just described it is, that, and am I off by saying, essentially, you're doing Mother Nature's work with a human touch? Well, that's a great way. I never heard that before, but uh, yeah, just, I, I, you just helped me understand it so much oh. better by by really saying because I, I and then it sounds silly by me saying uh, the groundwork and the pa paving the way when really it's always <laughs> been there. <laughs> Well, yeah, so the puns are the state of credit for something that's already been there. Yeah. In typical American fashion, we've labeled it, certified it, and now it's official. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah. I yeah. like that food is food is medicine is is something that um, I think that we all everyone struggles with, and I think whether it's a struggle because of your financial positioning in life and and you're forced to eat a certain way, or you know, or the the economy and the and the retail world you know forces you financially out of that path yeah. you know i think that a lot of people struggle with finding the right way to go and i think that there's a there's a fascination with um you branching out let's say of of staying the same path of of this is mm -hmm. what i did this is what my father did and this is what we're going to do and put our heads down and just produce mm -hmm. you you took that to another level by producing and helping and, and kind of what was the what was the pivotal point in your life when you decided to not just produce and be a farmer like everybody else and kind of set yourself, I don't want to say up, but you really set yourself apart from everybody and, and been a, like you said, you like helping people. So that makes sense. It was something innate in you to help grow a greater community and advance think, it. Yeah. The answer to that for me was in the mid nineties when I had, uh, I'd been very, very, very much committed to the concept of no tillage, not tilling. And then the advent uh, of on my farm, I had always dabbled in cover crops, uh, crops that cover the soil over the winter. And uh, I questioned, do these cover crops literally pay? Do they pay for themselves? Because I'm a, you know, we're running a farm. It's a business. They cost money. It takes time. 
And uh, so I was approached by the University of Maryland soil scientist, Dr. Ray Weil. He said, would you like to do some long-term studies on your farm, some on-farm research about the value of cover crops? And I was like, wow, yeah, sure. Uh, so we did that. And four years into that, in 1999, we had a drought year. And where I had used these cover crops the previous four years, we had about a 25% increase yield on my corn on a dry year. So I realized that I had done something to the soil that impacted a stressful uh, a season. And you know that answered the question for me. Even today here, farmers who have not yet deployed some of these practices, they ask the same question, do cover crops pay? And it's a little easier to answer now because there is a shift, there's a momentum that a lot of farmers are using them worldwide. So uh, it's not just a, you know, a little fad that Steve Groff kind of fanned a flame on. It's now, it's nationwide, it's worldwide. So the whole, the whole thing for me that really, when, when, I, when I saw that, I thought, okay, now how am I going to maximize their use? And at first I was just thinking about yields, crop yields. My soil is more yield re resilient. Well, then we started realizing, well, actually, this is also helping to increase the biological life within the soil. And that, in turn, helps to reduce um, fertility needs. And I won't go into all the details of that. But I'll just simply say, you look at a woods, an undisturbed area, things grow. Things look pretty vibrant and green. I mean, right now, we're in the first week of June. Everything's green here in Pennsylvania. How does that work? Well, that's just the way the soil and the microbes and everything was designed to function. How, again, I'm going to repeat, can we take that, that functionality and put it and grow food with it? So that's what I continue to learn today. And, and that's, you know, kind of the journey that I'm on. Um, and there's all kinds of technical things we're doing. And we're doing things down on a molecular level. We're uh, doing research in the DNA of the microbes. And I kid you not, I'm talking to a company about doing that. Wow. And 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 so so this is this is kind of like the, the cutting edge right now, you might say, in regenerative agriculture is really it's it's the biological life in the soil that we're looking to. And then guess what? We can reduce our inputs. We can reduce uh, the things that we used to, to use. Um, and, and again, I'm not an absolutist um, in like I don't want to get any inputs on my farm. Maybe if I can get to that point someday. Great. Uh, I hope I can. But at this point, we're reducing our inputs and growing a healthier food, and there's a correlation to that. So we're going to see how far we can go. Excellent. And what's the what's the point when you uh, decided to bring CBD into the portfolio of growth? So I first heard about uh, growing industrial hemp in 1999, uh, 25 years, 24 years ago, and I was intrigued with it. But we were naive, and we thought we could change the laws back then. But of course, we were way ahead of our time. <laughs> and in 2017, I had someone come in here from Colorado, a friend of mine, and said, oh, you need to grow CBD for me, you know, when it becomes legal. I'm like, what's that? I'd never heard of CBD before. And he told me. And I said, okay, whatever. Uh, then when it became legal in 2019, I was ready. I mean, I had done the preparation and so forth. So I planted CBD, grew it, got it, my own brand, cedameadow.farm. And, um, and, and here we are today. Now I'm also, I'm also growing fiber hemp as well. Um, I actually have 50 acres of that in the ground uh, right now. And we're continuing to grow CBD, but I really love the plant. Uh, the plant has so much to offer. I like to say, if God made any plant for humans, hemp is probably the best one. There's so many uses that we can use. And we've had 80 years where we couldn't really study it or research it because it was banned because of this little tiny marijuana issue. Uh, but now, you know, we're kind of moving beyond that. And we see so many uses of this plant. It fits right into what I'm doing. It's good for the soil. It's good for humans. So here I am. It's a perfect thing for me to grow. No, it's 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 a perfect fit in the portfolio, and this cohesiveness is is uncanny. And it makes a lot more sense now to hear that you've been you've been eyeing it up since 1999. That really yeah. makes a lot more sense. I, I literally have the brochure <laughs> in that meeting. So if anyone wants to see it, I can show it to you. I always I tell people as well, like I, I was very much into into the hemp uh, aspect and in, in, in years ago before all this. And I, I had the books and everything like that. I said, I'll show you my Amazon receipts. I swear. I was like, <laughs> I was more interested in the marijuana. I actually and it's going to lead me into my next question is if you could describe from a farming standpoint, because um, this is something a lot of us, we all know the whether they're ingestible edibles or they're smokables or they're topical creams. But not many people realize the fiber part you just talked about. Yeah. 
So kind of speak about the differences of, of hemp, the hemp plants when one's purpose is uh, mm -hmm. as an ingestible and one is a industrial uh, use. Yeah. So I like to use a corn analogy since most people are familiar with popcorn, sweet corn, field corn. Top corn, you eat the movie theater. Sweet corn, you eat in the summer day. Field corn is what you field, feed the cattle. It's all corn. Um, so when you look at, you know, in this context, I should say cannabis, the the more the Latin name for the plant, you know, hemp. And the word hemp has different meanings depending on who you ask. But let's say cannabis. Uh, you'll have certain selections that have been selected over hundreds of years for the plant to produce more fiber that can make clothing out of and textiles and so forth. Certain aspects of the plant for medicinal uses like, we'll say, CBD. And also, the plant has also been selected for high THC levels, the, 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 the psychiatric uh, psych, uh, psycho effects uh, that THC gives. So just like you have differences of corn, we have differences in hemp. Um, the problem, what happened in 1937 is, I'm going to say it this way, they used marijuana to demonize the whole plant because it would be my opinion now, in retrospect, that the big companies, big pharma, uh, even big ag, felt threatened by this plant, and they used the marijuana sliver of it to be able to ban the whole plant. So that's probably a whole other podcast. We could talk about that. But we lost the, the use of this plant for 80 years. It was illegal, and it's just so unfortunate. Um, so, yes, it's been abused, uh, but, you know, anything can be abused. And so... Uh, you know, I, as, as I as I look into the benefits of this plant, I mean, there's literally thousands of uses of it in, in very good ways. I mean, we didn't even talk about sequestering carbon. That's another thing it does good on and actually permanently stores carbon when you take hemp and like put it in as insulation for houses and stuff. There's so many things that can be done with hemp. Um, so that's why it's such a great plant. Yeah, that's from the fiber aspect, too. Like uh, a lot of uh, when I was doing the research a few years back. You know, not many people realizing that, you know, they, they actually make concrete out of hemp. There's yes. concrete. And, it and, it in. You yep. know, back in, and back in the 30s, we were using it, uh, making rope and holding boats, mm -hmm. ships and, no, and, no. and petroleum. I mean, it was, a, it was a substitute for fuel and it was an energy source. Yeah. And, and currently, the United States imports 150,000 tons of hemp from other countries. Um, you know, it's still until we build up our own infrastructure. Why can't we grow it here? Well, we can. And that's what we're trying to do. And uh, it, it's just, again, um, an amazing plant with a lot of uses. I think the time is right because there's a more openness to, I'll just say, natural things, uh, mm -hmm. you know, clothing, uh, all, all kinds of things. And you can mix it with cotton. Uh, it's uh, all the other thing, too. You had mentioned in the 30s. Well, Henry Ford literally built a Model T made out of hemp until it was banned. Yep. Uh, you can today BMW. And Ford is using hemp in the inner door panels and so forth in the interiors of certain cars. So we're already there. A lot of people don't even know that. And basically anything that's plastic, petroleum-based, you can infuse hemp. The herd of the hemp, the inside part of the stalk, can be infused in there to make it, we'll just say, more earth-friendly. Yep. And even racing, in, in uh, even in Formula One racing, they're using some hemp parts now. Uh, because of the properties of it are very light and very strong. So all of a sudden, you have tremendous opportunities out there. We can grow this crop. It can be good for the farmers. It's another crop to grow, and it's good for the environment. takes in a lot of carbon. So, you know, here, here we are, uh, you know, just at, on, on the threshold, I think, of a huge industry uh, in the decades to come. I, th I think so as well. And I, years ago, I was I had a t-shirt business and we we uh, we had a line of hemp clothing and stuff, but it wasn't to where it is now. I've recently bought some hemp clothing and, you know, the advancements of that fabric has gone so much too. like years ago. It was kind of a little it was a little soft, but it was a little a little rough around and stuff like that. Now I have some hemp clothing. That's a whole different uh, yes. whole different ball game. That's only been a few years. Yeah. I, I think that well, I'm, I, I've got a few more minutes here, about five more minutes, if that's if that's OK with you. Um, I, I, I'm really glad you talked about the the uh, industrial uses of hemp and everything like that as well. And kind of backing up to, you know, let's talk a little bit in the last few minutes about the dis 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 detachment of I want to detach Delta eight, Delta ten, all that stuff from the products you make. 
Uh, recently, locally, we had we had a big bust here uh, the other week. And, you, you know, you look at all the products that were in those photos and stuff. And it's like it's just that cartoon kidifying of, of the CBD world. And I want to speak. I want to kind of close out on that piece as far as the separation of the two. And, and I have my own experiences with, with carrying those portfolios. And I know you do as well. And I want to follow your lead in the sense that you defiantly do not carry certain products for certain reasons and kind of elaborate on that given locally here and nationally the the growth in uh in, in counterfeit foods and stuff like that and thc infused uh edibles and things like that being sold over the counter to anyone that wants to buy them basically yeah so um thc we're all familiar with that commonly called marijuana gives you a high um when you use it so when the law was passed in 2019, uh, there was essentially discovered a loophole that um, that we could, I mean, we that, that law allowed us to grow the CBD products and anything that's below 0.3%, below that is not considered marijuana and anything over 0.3 is considered marijuana. And just for reference, those who want to use marijuana, they would like something at 15% or higher. So 0.3% is a very, very low bar. So um, so just to give that in context, there was some legal loophole that allowed, um, and I'm not going to get into the details here, but allowed uh, a process to put Delta 8 or Delta 10 into involving with CBD products and it actually uh, depends who you talk to, gave you a similar high or not quite as much of a high as typical marijuana. The problem was there was zero regulation on it. And some, I think, unscrupulous companies actually was marketing that in vape shops and in stores and convenience stores that literally a 10-year-old could buy. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. only were they making it available to buy, they were packaging it to make it look like candy. Uh, and doing knockoffs like Rice Krispies and Kellogg's and different things. They did knockoffs like that looked like those brands. So a kid could go in the store and they could buy a couple packs. And and if they consumed some of that, they were on the floor vomiting or going to the hospital. And a couple of those incidences have happened. So that is, that is to me, is being totally irresponsible. Anyone in marketing should never have done that. Um, so... For me personally, our, our CBD brand, Cedarmeadow.farm, we we have a hard line. We're just on the CBD side of things. Um, and, and so, because I am all about health and wellness and trying to help people use these, these products in a way that will help them, generally help them. So um, the whole Delta 8, which is kind of the term we use to, you know, that whole category there, there is about a dozen states who have banned it now. Here in Pennsylvania, and I didn't even know this was possible, but here locally, Lancaster County has now banned it uh, where I live. And they actually went in and um, and basically seized products in stores uh, just under $300,000 worth here a couple of weeks ago. And then I, as a hemp grower, got a certified letter um, that basically said, you know, that I can't grow it or, or do it. Um, so... Or use it. So they really came down hard on it. And honestly, I feel it's a good thing because it was being irresponsible. Uh, and it kind of causes us to backtrack and say, no, 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 we're not that. We're not that. You don't have to worry about our CBD side. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Nate, because I know you're well versed in that, but yeah. that's my assessment of the situation. No, and that's that's why that's why I wanted to close with this. I wanted to let people know and, and really see that there are companies that are not fully in on everything. And there's some that are making very principled statements, very principled decisions, and very strategic decisions when it comes to that for the safety and, and health and well-being. And I think for you, that's just indicative of your entire mantra. And everything that you do is to, to help people the, to know that nothing that you're going to touch is going to bring something negative to somebody. Correct. Steve, I, I appreciate you taking yeah. time today. We are so privileged, and, and uh, this isn't just blowing smoke at all. We are privileged to have you locally here 
I'm privileged to be able to work with you. And I, I want to have multiple sessions with you on these because I think there's there's some that we're planning, I think, with uh, with possibly some doctors and a panel up and down the road and uh, possibly another one where I, I might bring you and Molly together and talk about the buying side of retail and the agricultural side. And we may do a session uh, specifically on supply chain management and different things like that. So we're going to have a lot of fun with this over the next few months. And uh, th thanks again for your time today and, and keep fighting the good fight because we all appreciate what you're doing out there. Yeah, thank you, Nate. Happy to help any way I can and appreciate those who are listening, your interest here. Um, regenerative agriculture is is definitely, you know, the, the future. Hemp is definitely the future. It's going to increase in all those aspects. So thanks again, Nate. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Steve. You enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Take care. Thanks.